Hello guys. Today's topic is John Keats. John Keats is one of the major romantic poets. Some people even think that he is the greatest romantic poet, the greatest poet in English literature like that he has been venerated by many readers. John Keats was unlike the other romantics from the lower class, from the working class. That is why some conservative critics uh, attacked him as Cockney school. Well, he was born in 1795 in an ordinary family. His father was a manager of the livery stables of his own father-in-law. And John Keats was the eldest of all children. He had two brothers and one sister Fanny. He was very much attached to his siblings. You know why? Because his parents died very early. His father died when John was only 8 years old and his mother died when John was 14. She died of tuberculosis. And eventually one of his brothers also died, Tom. Keats was a very sad boy. He was uh, attached to his brothers and his sister. And he was a friend of and he went to Clark's school in Enfield, where he had a friend who encouraged him to read and write. Very early in his life, Keats read Spencer, got inspired by Spencer. And one of his earliest poems, which was published under the initiative of Leigh Hunt, was Lines in Imitation of Spencer. Keats loved the medievalism, the picturesque quality of Spencer's works and also the romantic quality, romance. Many uh, poems are there of Keats which have the elements of romance. Now, you will be surprised to know that Keats loved boxing as a boy. He was apprenticed to a surgeon. We all thought of Keats as a very delicate boy. But he became a surgeon's apprentice. In those days, it was a very important profession because many people were dying of tuberculosis. And people had to know, people had to do bloodletting, which apprentices like John Keats did. He took care of his mother and brother while they were dying. And like the uh, later romantics, like the younger romantics, Keats also had a love-hate relationship with the works of Wordsworth. He was inspired not only by Spencer, but also by Wordsworth. And it was in 1817 that he started writing poems and publishing them. It was Leigh Hund, who was then the examiner, the um, editor of the examiner, the founder editor of the examiner, who got Keats's poems published. In Lehan's circle, John Keats met a few other young poets and painters like John Hamilton Reynolds, Joseph Severn, P.B. Shelley, etc. And Shelley and Keats inspired each other in a friendly rivalry. Shelley wrote Leon and Sitna while Keats wrote Endymion. But even before that, in the young poets section of the examiner, that was in 1816, Lehand had featured Keats as uh, one of the writers of the promising upcoming generation. The early sonnets of Keats include on first looking into Chap Chapman's Homer, as I stood tiptoe upon a little hill, etc. The, in these early poems, you find the Keatsian fervor for nature descriptions. And uh, his first collection came in 1817. That is when he actually became uh, acknowledged as a poet. And it was in 1818 that uh, he published Endymion, his first major poem. Poems 1817 and Endymion. 1818, both came under the attack of conservative critics 
of Blackwoods Magazine and Quarterly Review. The critical uh, depreciation of Keats's poetry greatly affected him. And uh, at this time, he traveled a little bit in England, hoping to get a better climate and health. And he started writing letters to his siblings and some of his friends also. These letters of Keats are sometimes prescribed in universities and exams. They are very valuable sources of information on Keats's ideas. Later on, Keats got inspired by Hazlitt's ideas on poetry and literature and he developed concepts like negative capability and egotistical sublime. His idea of oneness with nature, a synesthetic uh, understanding of nature, poetry as something that is spontaneous, all these can be seen in Keats's letters. Ideas on beauty and truth as you see in Grecian urn, etc. Endymion is a Hellenistic poem, Hellenic poem rather, Hellenic. That means it shows the Greek mythical story of Endymion being loved by the moon goddess. This poem is subtitled a poetic romance and it is written in heroic couplets famously dedicated to Thomas Chatterton. Endymion is written in a, an ordinary style which is not very pedantic and very upper class. You know people who went to uh, Harrow or Eton College, major schools, they wrote in a particular style but Keats's style was more ordinary. That is why critics did not appreciate uh, Keats's poetry. Also, Endymion was a flowery allegory. This romantic style was also looked down upon. <clears throat> In Endymion, the moon goddess Cynthia is seeing Endymion sleeping on Mount Latmos and he, she is falling in love with him. The famous opening line of this poem is a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Very famous line as you all know. Now, after this publication of Endymion, Keats began to really mature in his perception on poetry, which is when he looked at, he watched uh, Hazlitt's, uh, he attended Hazlitt's lectures and he understood that a great poet should have negative capability. What is negative capability? Negative capability is that capacity of a poet to be in uncertainties, mysteries and doubts without an irritable reaching after fact and reason. You know, in uh, a great poet's writing, you see that the poet is not trying to solve everything, the poet is not trying to uh, put his ideas into his text, the poet is standing apart a little bit, the poet himself is uncertain, he himself is in mysteries and doubts. He is not uh, irritably reaching after fact and reason and trying to resolve everything in a rational manner. This negative capability of the poet is what you see in Shakespeare. Whereas in poets like Wordsworth, there is egotistical sublime. Egotistical sublime means the poet is trying to put his ideas into his text and trying to solve everything. All questions are answered. Such poets are not content with, such poets are not content with half knowledge. So that is negative, that is bad. Negative capability is positive. At this time in 1818 itself, Keats was writing another major poem, Isabella or the Port of Basil. This is a poem with some gothic elements. And it was a story that he borrowed from Boccaccio's Decameron. Narrative poem in Ottawa Rima. Ottawa Rima at this time was used by Byron. Byron loved it. Keats, however, disliked it later. Isabella or the Port of Basil has a medieval theme. 
Isabella falls in love with a lower class man called Lorenzo. Her brothers do not like it. They kill Lorenzo and bury his body in the forest. Isabella finds the body, cuts off the head of Lorenzo, plants it in a pot of basil, waters the pot of basil with her tears. She is so upset. Her brothers wonder what is there in the pot of basil. Steal the pot and discover it. Throw away Lorenzo's head. She loses Lorenzo and his head. She loses her pot of basil. She slowly wastes away and dies. She goes mad. Obviously, it is because she is mad that she is doing all these things. This poem, which has a medieval theme, which has a very stark uh, realism about it. That uh, poem was greatly influential. Isabella was greatly influential on the pre-Raphaelites. Now, Keats has just ra started writing poetry. But all his greatest poems came at the end of the 1818 18 year and 1819. You know why? Because this was a very painful year for him. Sweet are the uses of adversity, as Shakespeare said. Out of all the adversities, his mother died before this and his brother Tom died. His brother George got married and went to America. And at this time, uh, there was a lot of harsh criticism from the Blackwoods magazine and Quarterly Review. They called he, uh, Keats, Lehund, Hazlitt, etc. Cockney school because they are lower class. It was very painful. And Keats even wrote to his brother that he is going to probably stop writing poetry. And then he also wrote in that letter. But I think, then he resumed writing. And then he said, I think I shall be among the English poets after my death. Matthew Arnold about this later said, he is not among the English poets. He is, he is with Shakespeare. Because Keats, whatever he wrote after this was so good, so beautiful. The Tory critics, the conservative critics, however, did not understand. They derided. Who are the critics? They derided Keats's writing. John Gibson Lockhart, John Wilson. They attacked Keats so much. Out of this pain, in the year 1819, came Keats's greatest works. At this time, Keats was uh, attracted to a girl in the neighborhood, Isabella Jones. But then, after that, he met Fanny Brown. And they fell so much in love. Don't think it was idealistic, pure love. There was a lot of jealousy and fighting. Keats could not marry her also because he was suffering from tuberculosis by this time. He, was not, he didn't have a lot of money. And this is the time when Keats started writing an epic poem. Which eventually he gave up writing. It remained incomplete. It is Hyperion. He gave it up because Hyperion had Miltonic overtones. And then at this time he also wrote another medieval poem. The Eve of Saint Agnes. And many reflective odes. The Eve of St. Agnes is a narrative poem. Do you know the meter of Eve of St. Agnes, anybody? You can write in the chat box. The Eve of St. Agnes is written in Spenserian stanzas. Remember, Keats wrote lines in imitation of Spencer also. And Eve of St. Agnes was written about a, love, a pair of lovers, star-crossed lovers like in Romeo and Juliet. This book, this, this story has overtones of Romeo and Juliet. The Eve of St. Agnes is at the story of Madeline and Prospero. And their, Madeline's nurse, Angelo, sorry, Angela, is helping them meet at night. In the Eve of St. Agnes, that's a feast. On the Eve of St. Agnes's day, it is believed that if a girl performs some rites and goes to sleep, she will see her future husband in her dream. And not only she dreams of Prospero, her, hus her lover Prospero actually comes to meet her. But then, 
it, it does not end properly because their families do not accept this love affair. After Hyperion, which is modeled on Paradise Laws, written in blank verse with heavy Miltonic overtones, he wrote a dream allegory called The Fall of Hyperion, a dream. It is also alternately subtitled A Vision. And during this time, I told you he wrote many reflective odes. There are six great odes of Keats. Did you know that? Which are the six great odes? Ode on a Grecian urn, Ode on indolence, Ode to melancholy, Ode to a nightingale, Ode to psyche, and Ode to autumn. So the, these odes, there's actually no no clear-cut evidence as to when Keats wrote these odes, I mean, which month and which came first and which came last. Generally, it is considered that Ode to a Nightingale is one of the early odes and Ode to Autumn is one of the later odes. These odes are very famous. Shall I tell you a little bit about them? Ode uh, to a Nightingale is a poem that is rich with imagination. He is hearing a nightingale song and he wants to escape with the song and just disappear with the song. It is an expression of negative capability. My heart aches, a drowsy numbness pains. Opening line famous. And then, uh, Ode on Indolence. It is not a typical classical ode. He describes a morning spent in idleness and he's seeing three priestesses come by in white robes. The three priestesses are love, ambition and poesy. He realizes that he cannot have all three at the same time. He cannot follow all of them at the same time and he's feeling very indolent. Then Ode on a Grecian Urn, it is not particularly based on any Grecian Urn. But he is uh, contemplating on an imaginary antique uh, in his mind's eye and he is seeing some images there, particularly two images. A piper is eternally piping and pursuing his beloved without fulfillment. And there is a heifer or a calf being led away by villagers for sacrifice. And he is thinking the village from where they are all going to the sacrifice will now be empty. This poem is an example of ekphrasis or a poem or a work of art in which another work of art is described. The last line of Ode on a Grecian Urn is are very, fam uh, very famous. Beauty is truth, truth beauty. That is all ye know and all ye need to know. The relation between beauty and truth are very complex, ambivalent and that is the crux of romanticism. That is how the poem ends. All these poems I have given uh, like with 5 to 10 points or 15 points like a powerpoint I have given here in this encyclopedia. I'm, by the way, I am talking about all these poems from the second volume revised edition of our encyclopedia. There are all three volumes on British literature as you all know. The first volume is up to 18th century end. Second volume is 19th century, third volume is the 20th century. So, next we will talk about Ode to Melancholy, Ode on Melancholy. He is uh, talking about Lede, the river of forgetfulness at the beginning and he is talking about how to cope with melancholy here. Then Ode to Psyche, here Psyche is the lover of Cupid, she is addressing the goddess Psyche. However, the, po the poem is not about Psyche and Cupid myth. He is talking about uh, having dreamt of the two lovers, Psyche and Cupid, sleeping on a bed of grass. And Psyche has no worshippers and he wants this sonnet to be, this poem to be, old, oh, sorry, not sonnet, to be like a temple for Psyche. Lastly, there is the ode to autumn. Autumn is the season of transience and here also he is talking about a goddess like figure to whom he is paying homage. Autumn is personified several times in this poem, three times as a female goddess 
often seen sitting carelessly on the granary floor or watching the apple cider oozing from the press or sound asleep in the fields. Beautiful images of autumn as personified as a goddess. So those are the great odes that are very important. There are six great odes written in 1819. Then there is a famous poem, La Belle Dame Sans Mercy. A knight is wandering and he's telling us about why he is wandering. There was suddenly a fairy who fell in love with the knight and he took him around. She took him around. He actually rode the horse and she sat behind and she saw, she saw, she showed him a lot of beautiful things and they did a lot of things together the whole day and then she put him to sleep and she disappeared. That is the dreamlike love story in La Belle Dame Sans Mercy. He also meets some other lovers of this dame who all said, uh, you will suffer because of her, she is just leading you on. And then in the second half of 1919, he wrote Otto the Great, a tragedy. Then Lamia, Lamia is the story of a snake goddess. Uh, uh, she turns into a woman and she is telling her story to a god. And she is, uh, she, she has, she had fallen in love with a human being, a man. And she was discovered to be a snake by a philosopher and she had to disappear from his life. This is the story of Lamia. And then uh, another volume of his poems appeared in 1819. In 1820, he stopped writing. Just imagine, he became, uh, he started writing in 1816. He became a poet in 1817. He was uh, severely criticized in 1818. He wrote all his great poems in 1819, finished the writing, stopped the writing in 1820. 1821, he died. So sad, short life. But with that, Short life, two years of writing, literally, he became the greatest poet in English literature. When Keats died, Shelley wrote, I don't know, a pastoral elegy commemorating his death. And he attacked the Tory critics for uh, destroying Keats's life like that. Keats's epitaph written on his tomb is, here lies one whose name was written water. It is a uh, touching epitaph, isn't it? And uh, these odes of Keats are certainly his greatest poems. They do not tell a single story. They are uh, talking about various aspects of Keats's perception on love, on beauty. Uh, it is Keats's consciousness that unites all these odes. Keats's sonnets are also very famous. You must have heard of on first looking into Chapman's Homer. When I have fears that I may cease to be. Bright star would I were steadfast as thou art. Famous poems. There are very strong Hellenic elements in Keats's poetry. Hellenic elements pertain to the values of Greece like paganism, love of life, love of joy. Contrasted with Hebraism. Hebraism is austere monotheism. Belief in one God, belief in rules, that is uh, Hebraism. So the, though Keats, unlike Byron, never went to Greece, there is a lot of Hellenic uh, influence on Keats. And Keats was a very great influence on Tennyson and Pre-Raphaelites. And um, Arnold said he is, he is with Shakespeare because Keats has a fascinating felicity, he has a certain architectonics, uh, he has a naturalistic interpretation that is not found in any other poets. A close friend of Keats, Leigh Hunt, is also an important poet of this time. He was a publisher of many periodicals. He published po poems like The Feast of the Poets, The Story of Rimini, Hero and Leander, uh, Abu Ben Adam and uh, such works. They are very important works. Another contemporary of Keats is also worth mentioning, John Clare. He was also a working class poet. And John Clare wrote poems descriptive of rural life and scenery. Uh, and village minstrel and other poems. 
the shepherd's calendar, the rural muse, etc. I have discussed all these poems and their works in detail in this encyclopedia. So, if you want any additional information, you can always resort to uh, reading this encyclopedia of British literature. Otherwise, no problem, you can read on your own from your own resources. Whatever it is, do read extra, develop a passion for all this, read original poems that is very important and continuously revise what you are reading so that you do not forget uh, before the exam. So, I hope you like this video. Thank you very much everyone. Bye-bye until the next video.